Testing. <clears throat> testing. 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 All right, we're live. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we're going deep into another computer vision paper. Uh, this one is called Cutler. Um, it's a cut and learn for unsupervised object detection and instance segmentation. 26 January 2023, so relatively recent work. This is coming out of a couple different groups here. It's a collaboration between uh, FAIR, which is the Facebook AI research, now renamed as Meta, the uh, UC Berkeley, uh, and the University of Michigan. So you got a couple uh, probably undergrads, potentially interns, and uh, Meta probably footing the bill when it comes to the actual uh, paying the price on these GPUs. So, seems pretty good. Seems like basically they uh, do some kind of vision transformer and then maybe compare different parts of the image and then use that to kind of auto-generate masks. So, interested to see how this actually works. They do have a GitHub. Um, Apache license. Uh, so if we look at their requirements, they have FAS GPU. What is this? FAS is a library for efficient similarity search and clustering of dense vectors. It contains algorithms that search in the set of vectors of any size up to those that do not fit in RAM. Okay, so it's kind of like a Similarity search. Uh, MIT license. All right, that's that's great. I like to see that. Um, I wonder what type of encoders they have. Right. I would assume they want to use clip encoders or some kind of large pre-trained image model to embed these images and or embed the patches of the images. Uh, you got OpenCV, pretty standard, different scikit dependencies, color, this one's cool, this one gives you kind of specific colors, it's really popular for uh, bounding boxes and segmentation masks, right, just kind of choosing default colors for those. PyYAML, YAML files, it's my favorite. They commented out the torch, so that's interesting. Probably don't even need torch unless you want to actually train. Cool, so let's get into the actual uh, paper here. The actual paper itself starts with a nice big figure here, a spread, zero shot, unsupervised object detection, and instant segmentation, so two different tasks here. Um, object detection is just bounding box, instant segmentation is uh, bounding boxes but with masks so usually this is done as a two-part uh, process where the object detection feeds cropped images into a second pipeline which actually does the mask tracing trained without human supervision we evaluate the model using standard detection uh, average precision right so this is a metric for object detection. Cutler gives strong performance in a variety of benchmarks spanning diverse image domains, video frames, painting, clip arts, complex scenes, etc. Compared to the previous state of the art, free solo with a backbone of ResNet 101. So that's a relatively large uh, backbone, right? Cutler with a backbone of ResNet 50, which is half the size, provides strong gains on all benchmarks, increasing performance by 2x. 
All right, so smaller model, better results. So it seems like they're doing something good there. Ooh, do you want to see the the? Okay. We propose Cutler, which is an abbreviated form of Cut and Learn. We're starting to get a little crazy with these names here. A simple approach for training unsupervised object detection and segmentation models. We leverage the property of self-supervised models to discover objects without supervised supervision and amplify it to train a state-of-the-art localization model without any human labels. Okay, so that's basically what they're going to be doing. Uses our proposed mask cut approach to generate coarse masks for multiple objects. And then, okay, so you got coarse masks and then learns a detector on these masks using our robust loss function. Okay, so they got some custom loss function here. We further improve performance by self-training the model in its own predictions. Compared to prior work, Cutler is simpler, compatible with different detection architectures, and detects multiple objects. Cutler is also a zero-shot unsupervised detector and improves detection performance by over 2.7 on 11 benchmarks. Okay. And then they kind of cherry-pick some specific benchmarks to beat. Okay, object localization is critical task. Training models for localization. This camera is like right in front of this paper, so it's kind of hard to see. Localized points, but they're both difficult and resource intensive to collect without accounting for overhead. Annotating 164K images on the Coco dataset with masks took more than 28 human hours, so this is kind of cool. It's a metric that uh, you don't necessarily see all the time, but that's how many hours it actually took to annotate the Coco dataset. Our key insight is that simple probing and training mechanisms can amplify the innate localization ability of self-supervised models. <clears throat> Our method, Cut and Learn, consists of three simple architecture and data agnostic mechanisms. Cutler is trained exclusively on unlabeled ImageNet data without needing additional training data, but contrary to these methods, Cutler can be directly employed to perform complex segmentation and detection tasks over a wide range of domains. Okay, we propose Mask Cut that can automatically produce multiple initial coarse masks for each image. Okay. Second, we propose a simple loss dropping strategy to train detectors using the coarse masks. Okay, and then finally, uh, the, de de the detectors clean the ground truth and produce masks that are better than the coarse masks. Okay, so it's kind of like a, a two-step two -step process here, or maybe three-step even. Multiple rounds of self-training, so there is kind of multiple uh, different parts of this training pipeline, so it's not just the inference is a multi-stage pipeline, but the training itself is also a multi-stage pipeline. Ooh. Uh, capturing the similarity of local pixels to capturing the global geometry of the object. Prior work shows that a self-supervised vision transformer, a VIT, uh, right, this is a transformer where rather than a sequence of tokens, you're feeding it a sequence of image patches. You can automatically learn patch-wise features, right? So uh, cutting an image into these little patches, and then each of those patches is going to have an associated uh, same thing as a token vector, but here it would be a patch vector. Only locate a single, usually the most prominent, and cannot be used in real world images. Okay, so it looks like some people have tried to do things like this. Um, Detter is also another uh, Facebook research uh, project. Current state-of-the-art methods such as free solo and mass distill also require in-domain unlabeled data. Yeah, so it seems like one of the things they're kind of like selling in this paper is that you have zero mask data. So. I'm curious to see what that actually looks like because these other approaches here, they, they do have a very small amount of masked labeled data. 
but it seems like they're saying that they can do it with zero, which is interesting because then how do you even introduce the task of masking? And it's trained solely on ImageNet. Cuddler is simple to train and agnostic to the choice of detection and backbone architectures. That's kind of interesting. I think part of the reason the VIT works is because in the VIT, right, you're cutting the image into patches, right? And then each patch is going to have an associated token vector to it, right? You see here, actually, this is the attention matrix. So each patch is paying attention to each other patch in this image. Um, I don't know if that would work with a convnet, right? You'd have to cut the image into patches and then feed each convnet into, or feed each patch into like a little tiny convnet to get a vector from that. I don't know, this doesn't seem to make a ton of sense just yet. It works like CAPTCHA. Hi, hello. Captcha. Color trained solely on ImageNet on 11 different benchmarks. Outperforms prior works trained with in domain data. Cutler exhibits strong robustness against domain shift when tasted on images from different domains. Okay, so this is interesting, right? Uh, it's only been trained on ImageNet, so being robust to different data sets that have different kind of distributions is interesting. TY. Cutler can also serve as a pre-trained model for fully supervised object detection. All right, related work here. Self-supervised feature learning. OpenCV word segmenting on CAPTCHA images. Okay, so OpenCV word segmenting, let me see. like a Kaggle data set. These are just kind of classic computer vision techniques here, just kind of getting rid of the gray, original contouring. Okay. Yeah, you could probably run this on that. I don't know if it'd work. Like, it seems like all their examples are real world images, but maybe if you ran it on like a picture of text, it might actually segment out the individual parts of the text. It's interesting to see. Self supervised feature learning involves inferring the patterns within the large scale unlabeled data without using human annotated labels. Uh, contrastive learning methods learn such representation using the same instances or close to each other. Yeah, so contrastive learning is very popular to create these kind of joint image text embedding spaces. That's what Clip does, famously. Uh, and also Lit, which is a model that we were reading about uh, last week. But these type of losses that are more about shaping the uh, embedding space rather than necessarily uh, just getting a particular input and target correct, I think these are way more powerful, especially if you have huge data sets that are unlabeled. Similarity-based self-supervised learning methods learn representations via minimizing the distance between different augmentations of the same instance. Okay, so here they're basically saying uh, similarity-based kind of similar to contrastive learning, right, where ultimately you're saying uh, the two embeddings that come out of this particular image patch should be very similar, and 
here what they're doing is they're uh, basically heavily augmenting probably so something like left right flipping or like applying weird grayscale and, and weird distortions to the image and then they're saying even if i apply these weird distortions and left right flipping and these type of augmentations to this image these are both fundamentally the same image and the embeddings that they produce when i feed them through this uh uh base layer right this uh what is the word that they use here backbone should produce the same uh vector so that's what similarity based there means uh, and self-supervised because you're not providing any uh label with the image right all you're saying is that this image should be the same as uh this image if i take one of the images and i augment it but you're not actually providing any information about what is actually in that image. You just know that it should be the same. Clustering-based feature learning. So this is kind of another type of uh, loss that you can do in the kind of embedding space. So you're, here you're basically saying these vectors should be close together, or these vectors should be far away. Automatically discovers the natural grouping of data in the latent representation space. So one interesting thing to, to uh, in this uh, train of thought is like, there's this paper, really unreasonable effectiveness of uh, frozen confnets or something like that. I don't know if it's this one, but there's a uh, Andrew Ng paper I don't remember the name, but there's an Andrew Ng paper where he basically uses untrained ConvNets and shows that if you feed similar images, such as cats, through a ConvNet that's just been initialized, there's no gradients that have been pushed to it, that the embeddings for cats will be closer together than the embeddings for dogs, which is kind of cool, where it's like, there you don't even need to train a ConvNet for it to be somewhat okay at uh, clustering similarly similar images and uh, in this embedding space. I've shown that masked autoencoders, which learn representations via masking out a large random subset of image patches, reconstructing the missing labels, are scalable self-supervision learners. Yeah, this is another another task that is also within the self-supervised uh, realm, uh, which is actually what uh, I think Detter uses but basically you mask out certain parts of the image and then you try to reconstruct those parts of the image and that gives you a very good unsupervised or self-supervised learning task which you can then apply over a huge data set and get a pretty good pre-trained uh, model from it. Unsupervised our work aims to automatically discover natural pixel groupings. Okay. The main comparisons to previous work are listed in table one. So how is this different from previous stuff? Detect multiple objects, check. Zero shot, check. Compatible with various detection architectures, check. Pre-trained model for unsupervised detection, check. So they're comparing this to Dino, Lost, Token Cut, and Free Solo. Ooh. Dino observes that the underlying semantic segmentation of images can emerge from the self-supervised vision transformer. Yeah, I actually do remember that. There's a blog post for Dino, Dino Computer Vision. And in that, yeah, emerging properties in self-supervised vision transformers, there's like a specific image, maybe it's this one, but they show you, yeah, if you see this, this is the attention, right? So it's, it's kind of like a saliency map, but in this case, it's a vision transformer. So it's like, there's a, it's just basically showing you the pixels that are kind of related together, I think within the attention matrix. But you can see how it's like, it's really clean about it, right? It's not like there's this kind of Gaussian blur around the whole dog. It's very, very clean about which pixels belong to the dog and which pixels do not belong to the dog. So they call that kind of an emergent, uh, behavior from the vision transformer here. And really what that means is that 
with vision transformers, if you train on enough data, they'll basically automatically discover natural pixel groupings. Yeah, and this does not appear in supervised VITs or ComNets, which is kind of where I'm a little confused that they say that they're going to make something that's agnostic to the backbone architecture because I don't think you're going to be able to do this with a ConfNet, but we'll see what they mean by that. Maybe they only mean the backbone on a specific part of the training or the inference pipeline and not on all parts of the training and inference pipeline. Loss and token cut leverage self-supervised VIT and perform to segment one single salient object. These previous works cannot detect more than one object and do not improve the quality of features. Cuddler can locate multiple objects and serve as a practical pre-trained model for label efficient and fully supervised learning. Okay, so it seems like this free solo one is actually much more similar to what they're doing here, where they basically, it extracts coarse masks and then they have this kind of refinement to make the masks clean, but here they're basically saying the, ma the quality of the masks is low. Initial masks generated by our mask cut are usually better in quality and quantity than the initial masks used by that. Cutler achieves two times to four times higher AP box and AP mask than free solo. Okay, so it's beating it on the uh, benchmarks. Okay, overview of Cutler, figure two. We propose simple yet effective method to train an object detection and instant segmentation model without using any supervision. Boo, you gotta come up here if you wanna complain. My cat is complaining. We first propose mask cut to extract initial course masks from our features, and then we learn uh, a detector using our loss dropping strategy. Okay, so this is the different parts of the pipeline here. You have the images are just put into a vision transformer. Then you have this mask cut module here, which VIT, Hatchwise affinity matrix, mask, so I think this is the kind of uh, rough cut, rough mask. And then you have this kind of iterative refinement of the mask, I think. Through this detector that self trains with L, L drop. We don't know what L drop is yet, but I have a feeling they're gonna tell us here. Tackle the problem of unsupervised object detection with segmentation with a simple cut and learn pipeline, okay. Simple cut and learn. Our method builds upon insights in recent works, showing that self-supervised representations can discover objects. We propose a simple approach that can discover multiple objects and significantly improve segmentation and detection performance. First, we propose mass cut, okay. Generates multiple binary masks per image using self-supervised features from Dino. So I bet you that there's probably a hard-coded number here, right? So even in these approaches that say uh, this is uh, in entirely unsupervised or entirely self-supervised and we don't have to give the uh, machine learning model any kind of additional information, there's always these hyperparameters, right? And I bet you that here, the multiple binary masks per image, right? How many things are there in your image? There's probably a number. You're probably giving that somewhere. Uh, we show that a dynamic loss from called drop loss can learn uh, a detector while encouraging the model to explore objects missed. Okay, so maybe a loss with some kind of dropout or something inspired by dropout. Third, we improve performance through multiple rounds of self-training. Okay, so end cut means normalized cut. That's what the N in end cut means, I guess treats the image segmentation problem as a graph partitioning task. Okay, so a graph is basically a bunch of little circles with lines. Uh, graph computer science. Right, when you, you see the word graph, this is what you think of. This is uh, specifically a 
uh, directed acyclic graph. There's different properties of graphs, but fundamentally what it is, it's a bunch of objects, right? These little nodes, as they're called, and those nodes have edges. Usually those edges have a specific direction, and uh, there's a lot of math that uses graphs as kind of like the fundamental uh, unit or data structure. So if you can take your problem and turn it into a graph, then you can now suddenly apply all these tools and all these approaches that people have designed to work on graphs. So a graph partitioning task is choosing different parts of a graph that, uh, choosing which parts of a graph are belong to one thing and which parts of a graph belong to a different thing. And here in the, the thing is basically objects, right? You're trying to like partition it into rough objects. We construct a fully connected undirected graph, right? So fully connected means all the nodes are connected to at least something. Undirected means there's no direction to the arrow, right? So the little arrows that connect two nodes are not, uh, there's, there's no direction, it's bi-directional. We are representing each image as a node. Okay, so each uh, image is a node. Each pair of nodes is connected by edges with weights that measure the similarity of the connected nodes. End cut minimizes, so actually let's bring out our uh, green highlighter color here, which we use for uh, math definition. So anytime we see a, uh, they define something that's a, a variable here, we're gonna use this green. Similarity of the connected nodes. End cut minimizes the cost of partitioning into two subgraphs by solving a generalized eigenvalue system. Okay, so here's your weights. Uh, D, what is D? D is an n by n diagonal matrix with D sub i equal to the sum of all the weights in the jth dimension, where j is probably, what is j? j is the number of images. They don't tell you. What are the dimensions j and i? No good, guys. You got to tell me what that is. So basically what's happening here is that there's going to be a distance, right? The similarity between these between two nodes is, is uh, going to roughly be a distance in of uh, embedding space, right? There's going to be this high dimensional feature vector that represents an image. And images that are similar are going to have high dimensional feature vectors that are closer together, right? So the distance in that uh, in the embedding space of those two feature vectors is going to be smaller for things that are similar and further away. So likely what they're going to be doing here is that they're going to be trying to minimize the uh, the distance between those such that you end up with a graph where all the nodes that are similar are kind of connected and closer together and all the nodes that are not similar are further apart. The weights are i and j. Right, so what is what is i and j here though? Is it the pixels like? Okay, here we go. We found it guys. It's here, feature of patch i. So i is all the patches, right? So here you have nine different patches in your vision transformer. Each patch is i, right? So i represents all possible patches and then j is probably all possible images in a single batch. Token cut. The authors use the similarity of the patches in dino feature space as a similarity. Yeah, so this is the similarity of the weight. So they're using dino as the uh, basically the feature encoder. Dino is pre-trained on a huge data set that uh, Facebook has, so it's gonna, it's basically a very good pre-trained model. And specifically, they're using the cosine similarity, which is the cosine distance of uh, the last attention layer of a dyno pre-trained model. All right, and then ki is the key, is the feature. So k is like the actual, um, uh, the actual like vector that comes out of the dyno pre-trained model. So it's like the last layer of the dyno pre-trained model, right? Boo, what's going on, boo? Boo. 
And then WIJ is basically cosine similarity, which is uh, the roughly the dot product. So like cosine similarity of two vectors. Let's see if there's a nice little picture for this. Right, so what is cosine similarity? I like this. So this is a three-dimensional space, right? And here you have two vectors in a three-dimensional space. This blue vector represents hello world, and then this red vector represents hi world, right? Here's an even better picture. This is a two-dimensional space, and you have a vector which represents orange and a vector which represents apple. And the cosine similarity between the orange vector and the apple vector is the cosine of the angle between them, which is basically the dot product of the vectors divided by the magnitude of the vectors. So that's what this is here. It's the dot product of the two uh, vectors for the two different patches here, or yeah, so patch number I and then patch number J. Okay, so now we know what J is. J is also the patch. So here, uh, I represents this dimension and then J represents this dimension. So the weight of the attention matrix, right? So the attention matrix is represented by W here. It's just basically a bunch of numbers. And each number in this attention matrix is basically uh, how, how similar this patch is to this patch. So patch I to patch J. So every single combination is going to be there, right? And one thing you notice here is that actually they're on the diagonal here, it's a very high number. And why is that a very high number? Is because patch number one is going to be extremely similar to patch number one, right? Patch I equals one is the same thing as patch J equals one. So that's why that number is going to be very high. Okay. So we figured out what I and J are. Uh, thanks for the tips there, Christian. And we're gonna solve equation one for finding the second smallest eigenvector, x. Here we go. The limitation of token cut is that it only computes a single binary mask for an image and thus only finds one object per image. Although we can use the other n minus two smallest eigenvectors to locate more than one instance, this significantly decreases the performance. Okay, so This is interesting here. It's basically rather than making this uh, matrix and then and then finding the eigenvectors and then there's one that's going to be the highest and then you kind of go lower from there. I think what they're probably going to end up doing is they're probably going to initialize differently or something like that. Actually, that that's probably what they're going to describe here. But let's see. Vanilla end cut is limited to discovering a single object. Right. That's what they just described. We propose a mask cut that extends end cut to discover multiple objects per image iteratively by applying end cut to a masked similarity matrix. Okay, so iteratively applies end cut to a masked similarity matrix. After getting the bipartition X of T from end cut at stage T, so there's multiple stages here. We get two just disjoint group of patches and construct a binary mask MT where, right, you have a mask. A mask is basically just uh, the same size as the image, but uh, the values inside that are either going to be zero or one. Uh, zero means basically ignore this, and then one means take the value of this. So this is what an image mask looks like. Uh, image mask uh, computer vision. Yeah, so this is a uh, zebra, and then this is a mask for a specific instance of that zebra. So that's what a mask is, right? And all the values in the mask are either zero or one. So the mask for stage T for patch I and patch J, right? That's what this means. There's gonna be a mask for every patch combination or no, 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 there's going to be one mask that has a value for every patch combination. So here we have the patchwise affinity matrix, and now we have the masked affinity matrix, right? So it's the affinity matrix with, uh, I guess, everything that is 
in this, so right, so this blue dog, the dog that is Max now is uh, the eighth and ninth uh, image patches, right? And you notice how the eighth and ninth image patches are now zeroed out. So basically what it's doing is it first figures out uh, kind of a, a patch, right? And you can kind of see that this one, the eighth and ninth here, they, they make this like little blue square because they're similar there. The eighth and ninth patches are both of this one little dog here. And so they're similar. So that's where you get the first mask. And then what you do is you take that, uh, right, that attention matrix, or they call it here affinity matrix, and then you zero out all the values related to those two patches. And that's your mask, right? And then you basically just keep repeating that. You keep masking out uh, the patches in the matrix that correspond to the highest affinity here. So you see here, next thing they mask out is this big blue square here at the top. And through this, you eventually get to the point where uh, you've taken away all the different things that are similar. So maybe they don't need to specify how many uh, how many of these uh, processes or how many of these kind of like iterative masking steps they need to do because eventually you run out of image, which is interesting to think about. To determine which group corresponds to the foreground, we make use of two criteria. Foreground patches should be more prominent than background patches. Therefore, the foreground mask should contain the patch corresponding to the maximum absolute value in the second smallest eigenvector, mt. We incorporate a simple but empirically effective object-centric prior. The foreground set should contain less than two of the four corners. Okay, so this is some hard-coded bullshit that they're about to pull on you right here. So a prior is basically a, a weight. So in statistics, you can uh, basically do what's called, when you're doing something in statistics, a lot of times you have what's called a prior distribution. So the prior is kind of an assumption that you're making as a human about what you believe the shape of this distribution to be. So for example, something that's extremely common is a Gaussian prior, right? You're measuring everybody's height, and then you say, okay, I'm gonna assume a Gaussian prior for this. I think that the height of all the humans that I'm measuring is probably gonna be distributed as a Gaussian so that whenever I take this data and I start getting it in here, I'm going to start plotting it as if it was a Gaussian, right? So people took this idea of kind of, or more specifically, people took the terminology of prior from statistics and now they apply it to kind of the assumptions that they make in something like computer vision. So one of the kind of key assumptions that people will make in object detection tasks is that whenever you, whenever a human took a picture of something, usually the object is right in the middle of it, right? Like if you actually look at these pictures here, the, there's always kind of one central object in, in the image, right? The image is of usually one thing and then there's a background. So here it's like there's people and then there's a people are very clearly the object and then there's a background which is the grass, right? Here you have these chickens and then the background is the, the white background. Here you have um, whatever, this marmalade can and then there's background. So there's kind of this prior that you can apply that anytime you're dealing with objects and object detection, there's, oh, there's gonna be some kind of central object and then there's gonna be a kind of a background to it. So the way that they're gonna put that assumption into their pipeline is they're gonna say, okay, this foreground should have less than two of the four corners. So what do they mean by that? I think they mean the foreground and background. So this is the mask here. Right, so one minus the mask is the opposite mask. Okay, in practice, we also set the weights for uh, all of the, what's tau here? Tau is the stage, so I think there's tau stages of T, n cut to one e negative five, and the weight matrix greater than or equal to n cut to one. To get a mask for the t plus one-th object, we update the node similarity via masking out these nodes corresponding to the foreground in previous stages. Yeah, so that's kind of what we were seeing here. 
is they do this, uh, they mask it out, right? So the entire, the image patch for eight and nine here are just entirely masked out. I don't really know what they mean by foreground and background though, because to me they're both there. This is uh, like a summa ooh, like a summation sign, but this big number pi here. This is like m the it's like summing but multiplication. So you're summing over all stages from stage one all the way to stage t. And I think uh, each stage is the basically total number of images. So this would be one stage, and then you would have this would be a second stage, right? So if you're trying to get three different objects, you're gonna have three different stages. This is the mask, so the mask at that stage, K, what is K, where do they define K? They don't tell you what K is, come on dog, they need to be better about this terminology here. Oh, here you go, K is the key, so this is the vector, okay, they did tell us what that was. K is the vector, so this is the vector multiplied by each of the masks. And then this is basically a, almost like a cosine similarity of the vector multiplied by the masks here. Uh, okay, I see what's going on here. It's a similarity matrix, but you're making sure to mask out the parts of the, that are not foreground here. That's basically what it is. So this mask just masks out the parts that are identified as foreground so that hopefully the background is still in it. We have this picture here. We should just reference this picture rather than this GIF that very slowly changes. All right, here you go. Actually, they do do this. So remember when I said, okay, they're definitely hard coding this number. Here we go, dude. Here's the smoking gun evidence. There it is, set t equals three. So at some point, a human has to say, I want to do this three times because there's gonna be three masks because there's three dogs, right? So that's a little, it's a little bit no bueno because what happens if there was four dogs, right? So you have to specify that. Mask cut can discover multiple objects in an image without supervision but you have to tell it exactly how many things there are in the image. We build upon and create a patchwise similarity matrix for the image using a self-supervised dyno. So this is kind of their big pre-trained uh, image encoder. We apply normalized cuts to this matrix and obtain a single foreground object mask. We then mask out the matrix affinity values using the foreground mask and repeat the process, which allows mask cut to discover multiple object masks in a single image. Yeah, so basically they're just removing the the kind of parts of the attention matrix, which they call here affinity matrix, but this is basically the same thing as an attention matrix. Um, they're masking out the parts that uh, end up triggering the highest here. Standard detection loss penalizes predicted regions RI, so predicted regions RI, that do not overlap with the ground truth. Since the ground truth masks given by mask cut may miss instances, the standard loss does not enable the detector to discover new instances nor labeled, not labeled in the ground truth. Therefore, we propose to ignore the loss of predicted regions to have a small overlap with the ground truth. We drop the loss for each predicted region that has a maximum overlap. Okay, so IOU, intersection over union, this is basically a way to measure how much bounding boxes overlap with any of the ground truth instances. Okay, I think ground truth here, they don't actually mean like actual ground truth, whereas like someone like actually labeled it. I don't think they have an actual labeled data set, right? They keep saying that they don't do that. So I think what they mean is basically this right here, this mask that comes out of the first uh, step here, they're basically gonna call that ground truth and that's why they keep using these kind of single quotations here because it's not actually ground truth, it's like the the, f the output of the first stage. 
uh, the loss drop, so this is the kind of drop loss that they were referring to earlier, uh, is the IOU max greater than tau IOU here. Okay, so there's a threshold here, right? So if that threshold is the case, then you have this uh, vanilla loss. L vanilla refers to the vanilla loss function of detectors. So basically, it's like a it's like a just a detection loss, but uh, you also you are gonna drop it, right? It's either gonna be zero if you have uh, too much overlap. All right, so I think that's what this one means here. This one basically means if this is the case, it's going to be one, right? If there is enough overlap, then we just apply the lost. If there isn't enough overlap, then we'll just remove it, right? And what this ends up causing is that L drop does not penalize the model for detecting objects missed in the ground truth and thus encourages the expiration of different image regions. Okay. In this practice, we set a low threshold of TIOU of 0 0.01. So this is actually extremely low, right? This means that if there's even, even if there's just a tiny bit of intersection over union, right, a tiny bit of overlap, this loss will still be applied. Okay, multi-round self-training. Empirically, we find that despite learning from the coarse masks, detection models clean the ground truth and produce masks that are better than the initial coarse masks used for training. The detectors refine mask quality and our drop loss strategy encourages them to discover new object masks. Use multiple rounds of self-training to improve the detector's performance. We use the predicted masks and proposals with a confidence score of this. for the teeth round as the additional pseudo annotations for the T plus ith round of self-training. To deduplicate the predictions in the ground truth from round T, we filter out ground truth masks with an IOU greater than 0.5 with the predicted masks. We found that three rounds of self-training are sufficient. There's a lot of magic numbers here, guys. Like, this is a little bit sketch. They have, like, exactly three rounds they have uh these kind of like hard-coded like thresholds here with 0.5 like a hard-coded confidence score range with 0.75 and 0.5 like there's a lot of very hard-coded numbers here obviously they probably can sweep over them but for something that's trying to be like an unsupervised uh it's kind of trying to trying to kind of use this flag of like, hey, we're unsupervised, we're not using any external data sets, we don't require any labeled data sets, like there's a lot of hard-coded numbers here, so it's a little sketchy. Because also another number that's hard-coded here is the number of patches, right? Like just, there's different si different sizes and different uh, vision transformers, some of them have nine patches, 16 patches, 32 patches, there's different numbers of these patches, and the relative size of the objects in your image and the size of your patches that you choose is also another hyperparameter. So they, they haven't even mentioned that one, but this number of patches in your vision transformer is going to be an additional hyperparameter that's going to impact this. So there's a lot of magic numbers here. All right. So they're pre-training on ImageNet, 1.3 million images. Do not use any types of annotations. We use mask cut with three stages on images. Okay, they got 480 by 480 pixels. Patchwise affinity matrix using VIT B8. So this is a, a, a large, VIT B I think is the largest one with eight patches. So VIT model zoo. I always get the numbers or the, the letters confused. So let me make sure. Um, let's see, V8. 
bit b Come on, you guys don't have like a a table? VIT model suit sizes table. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so no, I'm not correct. VITB is the smallest one, which is fucking annoying. Sometimes B stands for big, and VIT big is the biggest one, but here it's VITB is actually VIT base, which is the smallest one. Then you have a VIT large, which is bigger than that, and then you have a VIT huge, which is the biggest one. So here, uh, VIT B8 is actually like a really tiny vision transformer. Right, eight is very small amount of patches, and then VITB is the smallest vision transformer. So VITB8 is basically the smallest vision transformer that you can probably use. <laughs> we use a conditional random field to post process the masks and compute their bounding boxes. What is this? Conditional random field. Conditional random fields are a class of statistical modeling methods applied in pattern recognition. Whereas a classifier predicts a label for a single sample without considering neighboring samples, a CRF can take context into account. Okay, our predictions are modeled as a graphical model. Again, so this is the, once you can put your problem, con uh, frame your problem as a graph problem, then you can apply all this like graph-based math to it. And an interesting thing here is if you guys know about reinforcement learning, right? Reinforcement learning is really, it's all sitting on top of a single kind of point, which is basically the Markov decision process, which is a way of describing reality as a graph, right? Where you have uh, a state, which is the node, and then you take an action, which is basically the uh, the edge, and then you end up in a different state. So graphs are very powerful. I, th I have some problems with the Markov decision problem, but they are admittedly very powerful. Okay, so CRFs are popular in NLP. In image processing, the graph typically connects locations to nearby and or similar locations. Okay, so it's probably just a way of creating a graph from the image patches here. Conditional random field for image patches. Let's see if we can get a cool picture for this. This one? Oh no, here we go. Course output, MRF CRF modeling. Output after the CRF inference. Okay, so this is like a, seems like an older paper here, but you can basically, I think this picture is kind of telling you everything you need to know. This one too as well, right? Where the mat, the graph that you're creating here, it seems like here it's fully connected where every single patch connects to every single, or every node connects to every single other node, but I bet you they do a little bit something yeah, I bet you theirs looks more like this, right? So this is a fully connected CRF, but I bet you in this paper they're probably doing like uh, something like this, where patches are only connected to the patches uh, next to them. Maybe, maybe the diagonals here as well. Yeah, so here in this patch, right, patch number one would be connected to patch two and four, maybe five, but probably not to 369 and 789. While Cutler is agnostic to the underlying detector, we use the popular mask RCNN. Dude, this is the paper that's never gonna die, dude. <laughs> like, mask RCNN is like kind of unnecessarily complicated. It's like this like multi-step, you're doing this like pooling, you're like warping the image, like it's it's gross, but it's just nobody's figured out a better way. We trained the detector on ImageNet with initial masks and bounding boxes for 160k iterations. Okay, with a batch size of 16. So this is actually quite a, kind of a small batch size. 
we'll see what uh, GPU they're using, but this makes me think that they this wasn't trained on Meta or Facebook hardware. Like batch size is 16. This was trained on someone's GPU at home, you know? They'll probably tell us at some point, but that's a suspicious batch size. When training the detectors with the ResNet 50 backbone, we initialize the model with the weights of all of a self-supervised pre-trained dyno model. We explored other pre-trained models, including MoCo, SWAV, and CLD, and found that they gave similar. Okay. So this is kind of interesting, little low-key comment here, basically that uh, Dino isn't necessarily better as these other ones here. We also leverage the copy-paste augmentation during a model training process. Okay, so this is a type of image augmentation where you basically just cut different parts of the image and move them. Rather than using the vanilla copy-paste, we randomly downsampled a mask with a scalar uniformly sampled. Okay, so a little bit more magic numbers here. We then optimize the detector for 160K iterations with just gradient descent. Learning rate of 0.5, that's kind of a large learning rate, especially for uh, a multi-step pipeline here. They might be uh, freezing the, the pre-trained model here. Right, with that high of a learning rate, if you have a pre-trained model, you're very quickly just gonna overwrite the, the weights that are there. With these pre-trained models, you have to be careful because if you fine tune with a learning rate that's a little bit too high, a little too aggressive, you're just gonna basically wipe it and all that pre-training is gonna be worthless. Right, because you have to realize that when they pre-train these like big models like this, they're using a learning rate schedule, right? And over time, over this like probably weeks or month long pre-training process, that learning rate is gonna drop and drop and drop and drop. So like the last, whatever, a thousand gradient updates that were pushed into this pre-trained model we're at a learning rate of like 0 0.00000001, right? So like the second you push something with a much higher learning rate, you're basically gonna undo the last third of the pre-training process. Something to think about. We initialize the detection model in each stage using the weights from the previous stage. We optimize the detector using standard gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent with the learning rate of 0.1 for 80K iterations. Again, really high learning rate, like kind of weird. A sufficient number of pseudo masks. We don't use drop loss during the self-training stages. We provide the details. Okay, so actually let's see. Yeah, it does seem like they're just kind of pushing it straight to the model. They're not doing any kind of freezing on the backbone. Okay, experiments. We evaluate Cutler on various detection and segmentation benchmarks. We show that Cutler can discover objects without any supervision on completely unseen images. Despite being evaluated in a zero-shot manner on 11 benchmarks, Cutler outperforms prior methods that use in-domain training data. Fine-tuning Cutler further improves detection performance, outperforming prior work. Okay, unsupervised zero-shot evaluations. Extensive experiments on 11 different data sets. Covering various object categories, image styles, video frames, resolutions, and camera angles. So this is kind of when people say uh, outside of a domain or inside of a domain when it comes to like uh, data, what they're basically saying is that certain data sets have kind of a certain style, right? They have their, the, the zoom of the images, the kind of appearance of the images, the camera angles, the amount of object centricness of those those are variables that are going to change from data set to data set, especially if you start getting into like some
custom uh, stuff, like, I don't know, like some kind of industrial use case where you're detecting, like, I don't know, like defects or something weird, right? Like the distribution there of camera angles, resolutions, and image styles is gonna be way different than something like ImageNet. So it's always important that when you're doing any kind of computer vision, especially kind of fine tuning or trying to do transfer learning, uh, pay attention to like what the different data distributions are and be aware of like, is my data distribution more similar to ImageNet? Is it more similar to this other data set that I wanted to train on? We describe the different data sets used for zero shot evaluation in Appendix A2. Cutler is trained solely on images from ImageNet and evaluated in a zero shot manner on all downstream data sets. Evaluating unsupervised object detectors poses two. First, since the model is trained without any notion of semantic classes, it cannot be evaluated using the class aware detection setup. Yeah, this is kind of important too. It can, this model is gonna be able to, to kind of crop out little things for you, little objects, but it has no idea what the classes for those are. Object detection data sets often only annotate a subset of the objects in the image. Yeah, that's true. So in something like Coco, uh, only some of the objects in the image are labeled, like for example here, right? Uh, in this image, right, you have this uh, cup, you have the orange, and then you have these like weird little like beans on the table, but the actual ground truth data set does not have these beans labeled, right? They do not count as objects, but Cutler, right? The paper here, the method in this paper, it doesn't know, and it's just kind of like, uh, it's gonna create, uh, it's gonna anything that like is vaguely object-like, right? Based on this kind of similarity and this kind of attention matrix, is going to be an object. So like it'll pick out every single one of these little berries, right? So, and even here, right? Like this tower, it picks out the tower, it picks out the faces of the clock, and it also picks out the this like little circle uh, street light thing. And actually, this this image is really nice. Obviously, this is cherry picked, but like look how clean this is. Free solo comparatively is like basically garbage. Doesn't pick out any of these things. Over here, it kind of picks out the wrong thing. It doesn't pick out the humans. So Cutler does seem significantly better than Free Solo just based off this one picture here. Average recall is a valuable metric for unsupervised object detection as it does not penalize the models for detecting novel objects unlabeled in the data set. Yeah, so precision versus recall. There's one, uh, uh, there, the picture in uh, Wikipedia is perfect, yeah. Right here, so. Recall is how many of the relevant items are retrieved, and then precision is how many of the retrieved items are relevant. So, in this image here, right, if you were using recall, then you would get a pretty good score because, hey, uh, I wanted to get the coffee cup, you found the coffee cup. You found the one out of one coffee cup, perfect recall, right? But if you were using precision to, to measure this, you would actually say, okay, I wanted you to pick the one coffee cup and you picked out whatever this is, like eight things and only one of them was the coffee cup. Therefore, you got a one out of eight score, right? Because you picked out all these other things that weren't the coffee cup. So I do agree with this uh, statement here that uh, because in this particular problem, uh, you can basically detect objects that aren't part of the ground truth. You wanna re use recall instead of uh, precision to measure the uh, quality of your uh, model. We evaluate Cutler on a variety of data sets and report the detection performance using AP Box 50 and AP AR Box 100. So AP is uh, average precision. 50 is the uh, overlap required. So uh, if the box has at least a 50% intersection over union with the ground truth box, it's gonna count as a positive hit. Average recall of AR100, seems really intense. Needs to be 100% intersection over union. Color uses a small model size and less training data than prior work. 
compared to the previous state-of-the-art approach. Free solo with a backbone of 101. Cutler with a smaller backbone significantly outperforms. Free solo requires free mask pre-training using approximately 1.3 million ImageNet data set. Yeah, so not only is free solos not looking good here, not only is the performance no good, but it's also trained on a mask data set. So, and it uses a bigger backbone. So free solo looking like an absolute clown right now. Color improves performance over 4X and 2X. Show some quality qualitative examples. Table three presents detailed detection and segmentation evaluations on two popular benchmarks, CocoVal217 and Coco20K. Cutler is not trained on any images, blah, blah, blah. Cutler can often detect novel instances that human annotators miss. It's very cool. I could see a huge uh, use case for a model like this as a kind of uh, pre-annotation model. So usually when you have a human annotation pipeline, right, you have these people that are working for scale AI or a company like this, and they're basically sitting there and they're just looking at images all day and like um, labeling and creating little masks. Usually they don't just get the raw image. What they'll get is kind of like a pre-annotated image, which is an image that already has a couple things annotated and they just kind of fix it, right? They just sit there and correct the annotation rather than create the annotation from scratch. So something like this, something like this Cutler model would be perfect for that kind of application that uh, allows you to kind of pre-segment, pre uh create different masks for different objects and then the human annotator just has to fix them. For a comprehensive comparison with existing unsupervised multi-object detection methods, we report the results for UVO and VOC. Yeah, significantly narrowing the gap. I mean, this is kind of a theme, right, that we're seeing in a bunch of the papers, and it's been a theme that's been kind of brewing for several years now, but basically I think to me this is the end of supervised learning. I think that supervised learning was interesting and cool and it was a way to kind of uh, make performance on a very specific task uh, get there faster. But now with the availability of kind of huge data sets and uh, better GPUs, better cloud services where you can train bigger models for longer, I think people are realizing that unsupervised learning is just way better, right? Unsupervised and self-supervised learning objectives are just going to get you a way better model, a way better feature space and than these kind of supervised setups. So I wouldn't be surprised if kind of the supervised stuff just goes away and it's all just unsupervised. Unsupervised and self-supervised. Zero shot unsupervised object detection and instant segmentation. Cutler outperforms prior unsupervised methods. Okay. Unsupervised object detection, instant segmentation on Coco. We report the detection and segmentation matrix and note that the pre training data detectors and backbone initialization. Methods in the top half are. The table will train on extra unlabeled images in the downstream data sets, while zero shot methods in the bottom half only train on ImageNet. Okay. Despite using an older detector, outperforms all works. Okay, so let's see here. We got pre training. Uh, this one uses ImageNet and Coco, right? Let's, let's see this one ImageNet and Coco. Uh, Cutler only uses ImageNet. The detector is some whatever custom detector in Solo V2. Here they're just using mask RCNN. Um, initialization, this is just different types of uh, model initialization. So here they're whatever this dense CL, some kind of initialization scheme. Here they're just using the pre-trained weights from Dino. So I think this is important too, right? They're, they're kind of shitting on free solo here. 
because it doesn't perform as well, but I don't think the reason Free Solo doesn't perform as well is because of all this other stuff here, like the detector and all this other crap. I think the the 90% the of that is coming from this initialization, is the fact that here you're initializing from Dino, the pre-trained rates of, of Dino, which has kind of a, a, been massively trained on a massive data set versus whatever dense CL is, which is probably some kind of like very narrow, specific uh, pre-trained model. So I think that's this is the real secret sauce here is basically uh, using the pre-trained Dino model. Uh, you have different average precision scores here uh, for masks, for boxes, and then here they're showing Cutler kind of doing better on all the state-of-the-art. So previous state-of-the-art, I assume that means everything here that isn't Cutler, and then this is just showing you plus 12. All right, so 9, 22 minus 9 is 12. So yeah, I mean, it does well. Label efficient. Fine tuning it on a target data set aligns the model output to the same objects labeled in the data set. Okay, so here they're switching out the mask RCNN for a like task specific detector. And then figure five is fine tuning the detector on different subsets of COCO. We fine tune a cascade mask RCNN initialized with Cutler or Moco V2 on varying amounts of labeled data on the Coco. We use the same schedule as the self supervised pre trained Moco V2 and report the detection and instance segmentation performance. Okay, so this is object detection performance average precision, and this is instance segmentation performance average precision. And here is how much of your data is labeled, so 0 to 100%. And you can see here how this gray line, which is the MoCo V2, and then this little other gray line here is Free Solo, and then the blue line, which is Cutler. And the, basically what it, this is showing you here is that as you label more and more of your data, right, all of these models are going to have a higher precision, have a higher average precision, but Cutler specifically seems to be able to get a higher precision with a smaller percentage of the data labeled. Right? And then they're showing you that that gap here is 6.66%. I mean, these aren't like crazy numbers either, though, right? These are kind of very close together, so it seems about what I would expect. We analyze the design decisions in Cutler. Yeah, what if you don't initialize the weights with the dyno weights? Because that's what I suspect is like the overwhelming majority of these results. We report results on Coco dataset, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they don't, they don't do it. They don't show you. They have base, they remove the mask cut, they remove the drop loss and uh, copy paste augmentation and then the self training. Right. So, kind of the big jump here is the mask cut. But again, I would have loved to see plus pre trained dyno model. That seems like the biggest one, but they didn't do the ablation for that. Adding drop loss brings another 1.6% improvement. 
each simple component is critical for strong performance. Okay. Token cut is also a zero-shot segmentation method. However, it only segments a single instance per image. In order to generate more than one segmentation, we use a modified token cut by using more of the smaller eigenvectors and combining all produced masks. Okay, so they compare it to this other approach that I think they were inspired by. It seems like token cut, it's probably a paper by, a previous paper by one of these authors, if I had to guess. But maybe not, maybe it's unrelated work. Ablations for mass cut and drop loss, used for training cutler. Okay, so this is the size of the image. As the size of the image goes up, the uh, average precision goes up. Kind of makes sense, right? Is there, the bigger the image, the more kind of information there is and the better you can kind of segment these things. Uh, the number of cuts, or no, this is the threshold. So uh, if you remember, there was basically like this threshold at which they drop the loss. So you can see here, there's kind of a sweet spot there, but it's not like super impactful. Number of masks per image. So this is the hyperparameter that we were seeing where it's just like you have to kind of assume how many things are there in this image. They kind of just hard coded it to three. Um, and this is gonna be data set specific, right? So in something like Coco, there might be three things per image, but maybe at the M&M &M factory, if you have a data set of like the M&M &M factory and in every image there's a million M&Ms, the, this N equals three is gonna be worthless, right? You'd have to have N equals one million. So this is kind of like a specific to a data set or a type of data set. Uh, and then TIOU for drop loss. Again, here we have another kind of uh, intersection over union how much intersection over union. So this is what we were saying. This is like a barely an overlap, and this over here is a larger amount of overlap. Multiple rounds of self-training can improve the pseudo mask in terms of quality and quantity. We show qualitative visualizations on the number of pseudo masks for all three rounds. Okay, so you can see how the kind of iterative self-training here does result in kind of cleaner masks. Design choices. We first studied the effect of image size used by mask cut for generating the initial masks. As expected, table shows that mask cut benefits from using high resolution images as it provides a high resolution similarity between the pixels. With a high threshold, we ignore the loss for a number, higher number of predictive regions while encouraging the model to explore. So this is the intersection over union threshold here. And its impact on the final performance is analyzed in table nine. So three rounds of self-training. We use different detector architectures. All right, so here they swap out in figure six, they probably swap out the, uh, or no, table 10 here. They swap out the mask RCNN with a couple different things. Yeah, so here they swap it. Mask RCNN, uh, different mask RCNN with, called Cascade mask RCNN, and then uh, the VIT, vision transformer detector and you can see how those change. Yeah, so actually the VIT is better. Right, think about that. Somebody spent all this time to like put the mask RCNN code inside their pipeline and they should have just used the vision transformer detector here. Like mask RCNN needs to die, dude. This code base is terrible. All right, the commonly used ImageNet data set has a well-known object-centric bias. Pretty cool, who gets credit for talking about the object-centric bias? Okay, this is not, this is just the generic Fei Fei Li ImageNet data set, or ImageNet paper. We also use YFCC, a non-object-centric data set. 
Cutler's performance on Coco is robust to the choice of object-centric or non-object-centric, as long as the same data set is used to train Dino and Cutler. Mm, let's see this. Let's see what non-object-centric means. Um, can, can we just like search? Dog. This still kind of looks object centric to me, to be honest, you know, because there's always one dog in this image and it's roughly in the center and it's roughly like, I don't know, 50% of the image. Maybe this one is good. You know, this is a good pick because you have a lot of dogs and they're kind of like weirdly positioned. This is kind of just a generic object-centric picture. But okay, maybe there's a little bit there. Maybe YFCC does have a little bit a little bit of uh, non-object-centricness. Summary. Object localization is a fundamental task in computer vision. In this paper, we have shown that a simple yet effective cut and learn approach can achieve extraordinary performance on challenging object detection and instance segmentation tasks without needing to train with human annotations. As a zero shot on supervised detector, Cutler trained solely on ImageNet outperforms the detection performance of previous works. Cool, cool, cool. So yeah, this is a nice little little paper here where they basically, it seems a little complicated. There's a little bit too much, too many stages here. There's like three different stages. They're also using a pre-trained detector. There's a bunch of kind of hard-coded numbers in terms of the odd number of like steps that you're doing this iterative fine tuning on. There's also some hard-coded number on the like number of masks that you're creating there's hard-coded numbers for the threshold. So there's some hard-coded stuff here, but you know, I think this is just another big win for unsupervised uh, deep learning, which I think is kind of already running ahead of the pack. Um, probably not good news for people like Scale AI uh, and these kind of data labeling companies because data labeling was really only possible, or was really only a worthwhile uh, market in the world of supervised learning. But now that everything is unsupervised, nobody actually needs uh, masks and bounding box labels anymore. And I think this paper just go ahead, just kind of shows you that. Um, when we look a little bit at the GitHub here, so let's go to insights, uh, and then you can go to contributors here and it'll tell you a little bit about who's contributing to this repo. Let's close out, it's taking a second here. Want to know how these insights are helping you and how they could be improved. What is, give us feedback. What feedback do I want to give? Contributors. Okay, so just a bunch of people commenting a bunch of crap. Come on, guys. Why is this taking so long? A little yerba mate for you guys. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, we basically have three different contributors here. Frank X. Wang, who I think is this main guy here, the main author, yeah. This is probably this guy. Uh, Hists, I don't know who this is, but this is Hugging Face. Okay, ML Engineer, probably some like nameless uh, Facebook dude who did a bunch of the code there and then fucking Ashan Mishra this guy's badass dude this guy's like he's been at Facebook for a while he wrote a bunch of cool original papers he's actually there's a Lex Friedman 
with him, I think. Lex, Mendy, Sean, Mishra. Yeah, he's he has a uh, Lex Friedman, like kind of an older one now too, but uh, this guy's really cool. I didn't realize it was him. I guess he's he's gotten to the level of research where his name is now at the end. He's no longer here in the front. He's now in the end. He's an advisor level guy. Um, but still kind of making... Let's actually follow him, dude. Why are we not following him? But he made some contributions too. No releases. This is cool, though. I like it. All right. I think that's it for this paper. Hope you guys learned something. Um, like and subscribe as always, and see you guys tomorrow.